Deputy Owner. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. You're very welcome. I want to go back to, to 1998 and entry into the Euro, if I may. Um, did Charlie McCreevy notify you in advance of his decision to decide the exchange, exchange rate at which Ireland would join the EMU? Did you discuss this prior to his decision? Yeah, of Ireland joined the, 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 the exchange rate. At what rate did you fix that? Oh, yes. Sir. Was it discussed at Cabinet? Um, I, can, I can't recall. Okay. If, if what, I, I, I'm sure it, it was discussed between Department of Finance and the Central Bank. Okay. Was the government aware of what the fixing of the monetary exchange rate for EMU would mean for interest rates? That it would. Um, it, it, it was considered uh, that fairly quickly on we should get stability um, in interest rates and that it would be lower. Uh, I, I, at that stage, our interest rates for many years, other than the currency crisis, was 10 and 3 quarter percent. Uh, in the currency crisis, um, well, it went to 13 and three quarters, uh, and of course the overnight went to whatever you like. It went to all kind of race 80, 90, 100 percent. But the view was, as I recall it, uh, that we, would sh we should come down to around seven. Uh, I don't, I don't believe that was considered back in. We're talking about 98. You're asking now, and um, would it come down to where it did? I don't think it was. I think seven was what was considered. Immediately after that uh, decision was taken in Europe with, with the minister. Commentators at the time predicted that a wall of money would hit the Irish economy uh, immediately following that decision, and then there was a, a, immediately a push for a fall in interest rates. So, what did your government do to protect the economy and people from this wall of money that was about to hit the Irish economy? The, to the supply of, of, of cheap money. Yeah. Well, um, we, we had at that stage uh, partnership agreements. Uh, I, I think we were endeavouring and, and were as a key. Uh, wages in, in, in line and, and salaries in, in, in line, what we thought was a sustainable uh, level. Uh, we uh, were doing our utmost uh, to, to generate uh, employment. Uh, we, we had, um, by 1998, we were on about 1.4 million people uh, working in, in the economy. Uh, we, we believe were opportunities to, to increase that. Uh, we were trying to attract new industries. At, th at that stage, as you know, um, was the area when we really focused in uh, on trying to get in foreign direct investment from the pharmaceutical sector and from the medical and medical appliances sector. And we made a huge push uh, from 98 to 2003 um, to bring in uh, as much foreign direct investment as we could to give quality jobs. Um, so I'm just not sure what the relationship is to my question in terms of the increase, the cheaper money coming into the economy as a result of the lower interest rates. What did the government do to counterbalance that? And I mean in relation to fiscal policy. Well, in relation to, uh, to, to fiscal policy, uh, I, I think all the way uh, through we were tr trying to keep the, uh, we, no, should I say, we'd keep the budget um, in balance uh, and to keep surplus when we could uh, and to write down the debt uh, as much as we, we could. And um, we, we did that. In, in 2001, in February, the EU Council censured Ireland for its failure to use fiscal policy <laughs> to ensure economic stability, given that we were now in a monetary union. Do you accept that charge? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I think it was, a bit, um, it, it was a bit hard on us, quite frankly. Um, not long later, I was lobbied extensively by the Germans and the French not to hammer them, um, uh, and we didn't. But anyway. In terms of the opinions, sorry, and, and what exactly you accept? It said that it had repeatedly urged the Irish authorities to ensure economic stability by means of fiscal policy. It regretted that this advice was not reflected in the budget for 2001, despite developments in 2000 indicating an increasing extent of overheating. Um, so what did you do about that? Well, in, in 2001 to 2003, um, we reined in um, public expenditure uh, quite, quite strongly, um, not because of, 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 of that uh, particular um, charge at, at, at European Union level, but because the economy in the dot com torn down quite severely, and, and we had to do it. But we, accept, we accepted the we accepted the uh, the charge. I know I know you've discussed this previously. But we, we accepted that uh, charge, and um, I, I don't I don't accept that we ignored it. I mean, I, I, we didn't ignore it. You say that you reined in public spending, but yeah. if we look at and it's a, a graph from the right report. It's in um, the documentation, page 81 of Volume 3, what we actually see in the years for 2000, uh, 2001, 2002, 
is uh, public expenditure increasing far beyond what has been recommended by the Department of Finance? So did you actually rein in public spending? Because what I see in this report is that we did. Well, the, the, the Department of, fin Department of Finance, um, if, you, if you look at their, their summer documents, they, they come in at a low base. And then you have, like, you can't, you, you, you can't deputy have a situation uh, where uh, the economy is growing very strong, uh, where you have um, unemployment, um, and still very high unemployment at, at those times. Uh, where we have many difficulties within an economy, um, and you just look at the budgetary position. Like it, see, it seems to, to most countries, um, from, well, if you're not, we're not talking about which, which year do you want me to? You, talk, you started in 98, then you went up in 2001, but which, which year do you want me to? To get into a long narrative on this, Mr. O'Hearn, I want to stick to the actual the council uh, censure. But also, what was also said by the right report, and if I'm correct, you said that you were in broad agreement with the report's conclusions. So on page 48 of the right report, it says that when talking about the monetary union, the impacts on the Irish economy and what should have been done with fiscal policy, it says Ireland failed this test of prudent fiscal management. Do you accept that? I, I, I accept it now in, in, in hindsight because we would have built up bigger balances. But can I say at the time, Deputy, um, we still had over 10% unemployment. Uh, we, we, we still had um, an inability to give jobs to the young people in this country. And it seems to me, and, and today, if it wasn't been what happened, uh, to, uh, to be writing down debt, um, which we were substantially, saving interest payments, uh, growing the economy, creating jobs, bringing in foreign investments, spending on infrastructure, having a balanced budget and creating surpluses. You know, if that wasn't complying um, uh, with, with what, what, what you wanted us to do, I don't know what was. It's not, it's not what I wanted you to do, Mr. Hearn, but does, does that mean that you didn't, that you ignored the censure from the Council? No, I, Did I you accept what Mr. Wright says, that we failed the test of prudent fiscal management? And Mr. Cowan accepted that as well when he was well, before us. Does that mean you if you ask me to say cancel? now, if you ask me to say now, um, it, w should we have built up more balances if we knew there was going to be a, a bust in 2008? Yes. If you ask me from the position where I was Taoiseach um, chairing the cabinet uh, in 1998-2000, in 1998 where we had unemployment. Uh, and, and a whole lot of infrastructure issues which we have to deal with, and a demand to try to, to bring up the country to EU averages, then, then, then the answer was no at that stage. Like, if, if hindsight was foresight, you know, I'd be a billionaire, and so would you. At the but, time, but, but, Mr. But at, 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 at the time, at the time, I thought what we were doing was conservative. In fact, I was, I, I was, I was considered. Uh, a, 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 a conservative at that stage. Despite the censure from the council, and despite but also... The, the, the council, can I say this? I spent a lot of my life in Ecclefin and the council's deputy. And, you know, if you're a small country, I did. A few years later, Germany were way over the line, way over the line. Uh, and, and I had the chance to come down to say to me, keep your mouth shut, Bertie. Come on, so don't give me that. Yeah, and the central bank in 1999. Low interest rates have simply added fuel to the Irish economy. They've pushed up the demand for credit and they have been a contributing factor to the excessive rises in house prices. Did you ignore that warning from the central bank? Again. Sorry. Low interest rates have simply added fuel to the Irish economy. They've pushed up the demand for credit and they've been a contributory factor to the excessive rises in house prices. Central bank in 1999, prior to the censor from the council. It, 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 um, the, 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 low, the low interest rates gave cheap money. Um, and, there were, and there, it wasn't only that. In, in 1999, if, if, if we want to look back, Chairman, I think one of the things we did in 1999 was when uh, we moved from giving mortgages for, from um, a gross to a net basis, uh, when we changed it from 20, 25 years to 30, 35 and 40 years, I think that had a greater uh, effect. I want to stick to looking at what was been warned, the warnings from the central bank in relation to the budgetary policy of your government. If we look at the central bank pre-budget letter uh, towards the end of 2000, this is for the budget for 2001, it warned that despite the strong surplus position, the case against an expansionary budget is convincing, as this would heighten the risk of a hard landing for the economy. Did you ignore that advice when uh, agreeing the budget for 2001? 
No, I don't think the minister did. Quite, 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 quite frankly, I, I think the, the minister. The next two budgets were expansionary budgets, going yeah. against the advice of the central bank. But, but two, t 2001 to 2003, um, after the dot com or during the dot com period, were not considered um, uh, expansionary, expansionary budgets. You know, taking into account um, the fact that we had uh, a, a lot of money into the system. Um, and you know we, we, we had a, a growing economy. Sorry, I'm sorry, just because the figure shows that in 2002, spending was 22% up on the previous year for the first six months. Is that not expansion? Uh, if you what, what, what was the current budget deficit in in, in, in 2002? Is that not expansion? No, but Mr. what's the current budget deficit? Like, with the greatest respect. Um, if, if you're the, the Minister of Finance um, and the Department of Finance uh, and you're, you're devising your budget, and I've been lucky enough to be at the Cabinet table, I think, for about 20 of them, um, you're looking at what your current budget deficit is, you're looking what your exchequer borrowing requirement is, you're looking what your debt to GDP ratio is, um, uh, you're looking at what your income is. Um, and, and you're taking all these things into account. I, I'm not disagreeing with, but I, I'm just saying that you can't take one in isolation okay. of the others. That's, that's all I'm saying. Fair enough. Well, let's talk about the Minister for Finance, then, because when he was before the committee, I asked him in what way the elections in 2002 impacted upon the budget decisions in 2000 and 2001. And his reply to me was, I'm sure that when an election is coming up, that you'll be very, very conscious in the previous year to 18 months, as the same as this government is very, very conscious of not trying to do something which is going to antagonise the electorate. And certainly, all governments of which I have been a member, and all governments when I wasn't a member, have always borne that very much in mind. So the answer to your question is, Mr McCreevy, yes, of course, the upcoming election has always influenced measures which the government do at election time. We are politicians, don't forget, and we actually like to be re-elected. Is that a true reflection of your government? Um, I don't think we ever did anything irresponsible on the base into a budget. And to be honest, which I hadn't got much competition in 2002, so I, you know, I wasn't that worried about whether I'd be re-elected Taoiseach or not. So it might have been a bit tougher in 2007. Um, so I, I don't think we were in, involved in, in, in doing uh, anything um, that I would consider near irresponsible in, in 2002, because I considered my job as Taoiseach, my constitutional role, uh, is to serve the, the people and do things responsibly. And uh, I, 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 I think if, I, if you ask me, do I have to accept or disagree or agree with what Mr. McCreevy said, um, there is a touch of that you did something irresponsible, and, and I don't think we, we did. Okay, well, immediately after that election in 2002, Mr. McCreevy sent a memo to every government department demanding cutbacks in spending. Why? Yeah, because, which, which he said to you, the economy started growing. Um, massively in that year and ended up very low. Uh, it was 12% in January and ended up 1% in December. So there was, an, there was an enormous drop in one calendar year because of the dot-com. And that was the reason that you had to go back. In 2002? Yes. The dot-com bubble was in 2001? Yeah, but the, the, the effect into the Irish economy okay. was 2001, 2002 so, and 2002. And the forecast didn't predict this then, for 2002, the economic forecast didn't. Um, the, the, the economic forecast, uh, I, I can't recall what the, what the figure was, but the, the economic forecast in 2001, uh, 2 and 3 was we were under quite a lot of pressure and, a, and quite a lot of criticism. Uh, and it, it was a tough three-year period. Okay. Um, moving forward then um, through to before 2007, um, in an interview with Sunny Independent in November 2014, you said competitiveness has, has certainly been lost for three or four years by 2007. Investment in residential property went to 13% of our national output in 2006. That's about double what it should have been. The share of employment in construction was too high, but the OEC didn't pick it up at the time. And from reading their reports, which I used to do, I didn't pick it up. The 2003 OECD report said that tax incentives that boost demand in an already overheated residential market should be cut. The 2006 report stated domestic risks were important too, of which the most prominent was the risk of overshooting house prices. Although a soft landing was considered the most likely scenario, a sharper fall could not be ruled out. Did you miss these warnings when you were reading the OECD reports? No, I don't think that, but you know, after you, you've, been, you, you've been reading these things massively and I admire you for, for all you have to do in that, but you, you can see what they do. 
they give the upsides and they give the downsides. Um, and they, they, they give conclusions, they give some criticism, they give some praise. Um, but I do accept um, what I said in that article is, is true. Um, competitiveness, of course, is a, is a, is a loose term that's, that's thrown around, but a competitiveness, um, when I, I was talking in, in, in that article and in many other times that I've accepted, and I, this is what I do accept more so than I accept the expenditure argument, I accept that we got the competitiveness issue wrong. Um, uh, competitiveness in its broadest sense is, is, it covers a, a, a wide range of factors. It, it includes productivity, uh, quality of of output, innovation, sales, marketing expertise, quality of infrastructure, and I suppose mainly salaries. Um, they, that's, that's what competitiveness is. And we did, I think from the period 2000 on, um, uh, miss out uh, that we were losing uh, market share and we were losing our competitiveness. Um, and, you know, if we were doing things differently, that issue, I would argue some of the other issues, but I think that issue I don't argue about because I think that broad definition of competitiveness, we were letting, so we, were, we, were switching, we were switching from exports, which in most of my political career in finance, and in, I, I was always, my paranoia was keep exports high because that gave us more consumption, that gave us domestic demand. But then we lost on the exports and we moved um, to, to domestic demand, uh, and that was the mistake we made. If you look at what Germany did in the same period, they went the other way, gains 10 per cent competitors. We, we lost, and that was a mistake. 2007 was a, another election year, and I think by your own admission you were in a bit more trouble then. It's been written by Pat Leahy that Brian Cowan favoured a more prudent approach to budgetary matters than you did in the run-up to that election. He wanted to emphasise caution and restraint and avoid big tax-cutting promises. So did the election of 2007 have an impact on the budgetary decisions made in that year for 2008? Um, I, I, I think per, perhaps uh, in that year, 2007, public expenditure was, was, was too high because um, uh, there, there were a lot, there were a lot, of, a lot of warnings um, around in that period. And I think we, if, 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 you're certainly, if you're certainly doing it, if you ask me now, but certainly going through it again, you, you would have taken a different view. I'm asking about the time. Uh, in 2007, tax receipts fell two billion below expectations. And yet for the budget for 2008, you increased current spending by 8% and capital spending by over 10%. Why? Well, um, current expenditure, I think, might be too high. Capital, we were being advised by all the organisations that that was the right thing to do. Uh, that we still had infrastructural deficits. So I think on the current side, um, we should have tightened up. And on the capital side, 10, 10 was high, because overall we were working to a 5% uh, on infrastructure, 5% of, 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 of GMP. Um, on the current side, it was time to be getting tighter at that stage. Did you get the 2008 budget wrong then? Uh, 2008, uh, I think Minister Cowan has given his view, and I agree with his view. Do you feel that you ignored the views of the Oireachtas or the concerns of the Oireachtas in devising that budget? Um, well, which, which end of the Oireachtas? Every, every, every day I was in the Oireachtas. The opposition? Well, the, 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 opposi the, the, the opposition collectively, um, every day I went in, I still hear it in my ears, um, you know, spend more on this, that and the other. I don't so remember her, ever hearing anything else. It, it, it's in your evidence book, volume 5, page 59. It's a series of questions, parliamentary questions, put to the Minister for Finance uh, at the beginning of 2007 and through for the first six months, asking questions about the tax policies underpinning the growth and revenue, confidence in the mechanisms used to make exchequer return predictions, the heavy reliance of the exchequer on revenue from the housing sector, the overdependence of the economy on the construction sector, dependence on insecure sources of tax revenue from property, the views of the IMF that Ireland is one of the most vulnerable countries to the ongoing international banking crisis and credit crunch. And you go ahead and you increase spending for, for 2008. So were you aware of those concerns being raised by opposition TDs in the door, and did you pay attention to them? Um, I, I've read the questions. Um, a lot of them were written questions. But um, I'd have to say that the first question, do I think that 2008 was too high in public expenditure? The answer is yes. Did I listen to the opposition in, in, in the House? I would have spent three times more if I listened to them. Okay. 
Um, do you expect the findings of the Nyberg report on page four, where it says, as demonstrated by the previous scoping reports, although clearly affected by external conditions as set out above, the Irish crisis was in all essential aspects homegrown? Yeah, I, 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 I read that. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You're not sure? No. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't. There were two, two major things happened, Chairman. Um, the amount of taxation that was directly related um, uh, to uh, the residential, to, to property, was too high. Too high. And then. Um, you know, I, 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 I accept responsibility for that. I was head of government. Um, 24%, almost 25% um, in the economy. You know, you know that, that, was, that was ghastly. When you look back at it, you, you, you see it. Um, on the other side, you look what the banks did. Um, you know, the Nyberg report. All that happened uh, on, on, on the banking side. Um, but the, the bit I'm not too sure of, uh, the, the, the international crisis that came on top of it. Talk about all the cards being played against you in, in, in one go, Chairman. Um, I, uh, I think sometimes uh, we forget uh, internationally just the extent of what was happening worldwide in those few months. Rightly so, we looked at what was happening in Ireland. And, and how it was affecting us and the banks were fine. But look what was happening worldwide, the extent of the investment bank system, the banking system, but the world under. To, to get that on top of our problems, and not defending our problems, I, I've said the two vulnerabilities that were there. One I take responsibility for. I take no responsibility, um, none, um, for what was happening in the central bank um, or, or in the financial regulator, because I had no knowledge or control over it, despite what people um, uh, think and accuse me of. Um, but the international hit, the international hit was just massive, and I, I think that it, to, to kind of say that that had nothing to do with it, um, does not. I'm not uh, if, if I was here with him, I'd, I'd have an argument with him, but, he, but he's not. But I just think that is, is too harsh a statement, uh, and, and I, I would like to be able to argue that point uh, with him. Just reload a bit of time for that. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just to, to move on then, if I may, Mr. Hearn, to um, 2007, and you established the Domestic Standing Group. Um, did you pay any attention to its work? Domestic Standing Group? Yeah. So, not, not, not a lot. Um, I knew it was there. Uh, I've said what I've had in my statement about it. Um, I, I was aware um, uh, that there were meetings. Um, but we did not receive the reports in, in the Department of the Taoiseach from it. We went. We didn't participate in it. None of my officials were on it, um, and we weren't being we were, we were not being briefed. And uh, I cannot re ever recall it being um, being briefed to the cabinet on it either. So, were you aware of the of the increasing liquidity problem facing the banks from 2007 on? You were aware of that problem. Yes. And did you do anything about it? I, I, dis I, I discussed it um, when I came back from holidays that year. I, I discussed it with the uh, with the governor um, and. Uh, uh, we had numerous discussions on the liquidity issue, uh, ongoing discussions, all the way from August 2007 right till the time I left. The liquidity issue was, I would have had numerous, numerous discussions with the Minister of Finance. Where then that the Governor of the Central Bank and the Financial Regulator uh, went to each of the banks in March, April of 2008 and what was called the Green Jersey Agenda, because one Irish bank couldn't borrow from anyone and another Irish bank couldn't get any money from the other Irish banks to ask the banks to lend to each other. Were you aware of that initiative? I wasn't. You weren't aware of that? No. Okay. Thank you. And then just, just moving on then, past your time as Taoiseach, you gave an interview in the Sunday Independent in November 2014, talking about what skills were needed in 2008 and 2010, and you said, I knew my way around all of these things, and you were referring to the NTMA, the Department of Finance, the ECB, Jean-Claude Trichet, who you knew personally. I knew my way around all these things while Brian Cowan was only in the door. So that's the pity about that period. Are you saying that if you were still Taoiseach in 2008 and in 2010, there would have been a different outcome for the country? No, I'm certainly not. I don't think the outcome, unfortunately, um, would have been maybe no better. Uh, Brian Cowan did a, a very good job, and, and, and Brian Lennon, in, in, in my view. The um, point I was making, but 
you know, I, I, I knew these people very well and I knew the European statement very well and I knew them personally. Um, I think it would have been easier on my, my colleagues. I knew Jean-Claude Crichet from the 1991-92 currency crisis when he was head of monetary section of, of, of the French Department of Finance. Um, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, was head of the, uh, the Eurogroup. Uh, I had been Minister of Labour with him, Minister of Finance with him, and, and, and Taoiseach Prime Minister with him. Um, so I, I, I would have been you know, personally very, very friendly to these people. And, and How different to that, I made? Well, it, it, I think it would have been able to put a bit of lean on them. When that Mr. Cowan could when, when they, well, they didn't help them. Uh, as, you, as you've heard time and time again here, they didn't help them very much. So maybe the outcome would have been no, absolutely no, no, no different. Uh, but I have point. to say, uh, I, I, I felt it hard during that period because it was only gone a few months, and, and you, I, I would have felt I would have been able to be of help. If, if you've asked the, the direct question, would it have made any difference? And I've said to you, no. Okay. Well, why did you say when you left the door that I would have loved if somebody somewhere had have told me what was going on in the banks in this country, but nobody ever did? And you just told me that you did know about the increasing liquidity problems facing the banks, and you'd spoken to the central bank governor about it. Um, I, I was talking about the point uh, which I dealt with earlier to Deputy Doherty that um, uh, the, the extent that so few people owed so, owed so much um, with very poor guarantees and very poor stress tests uh, or checks on their ability to be able to deal with those loans. That's the point, I think. And just, um, and it never was given that detail. Okay, you never given that detail. And then just about mistakes that you think were made by your successors in government in the Department of Finance, if you thought any mistakes were made, because again, from that same interview in the Sunday Independent in November 2014, when you're asked about the pressure that Jean-Claude Trichet was putting on Brian Lenehan, you said, the reality in life is when you're around a long time, maybe the mistakes you make the first time, when you do them about the sixth time, you don't do it again. When you're doing it the first time, it's not so easy, but that's what's called, in inverted commas, experience. Uh, did you feel that Brian Lennon did not have enough experience to be the Minister for Finance? And if mistakes were made, what mistakes were they? No, I don't think Brian Lennon or, or, or Brian Cowan made any mistakes. I think they did our very best in the circumstances that were there. But it wasn't easy for them. You know, but they, I remember during the currency crisis, the, the then Governor of the Central Bank saying to me that I was unlucky in one way, and I was lucky in another. And um, I asked him what did he mean, and it was Morris Style, a very good governor of the Central Bank. Um, and he said, you're, you're unlucky to be here when there's a currency crisis to the extent and the level that it is, but you're lucky to be here to gain the experience um, in this particular time. And you know, it, it, it was that time that we had the group, which afterwards was like the domestic banking group. Uh, during that whole currency, um, the Governor of the Central Bank, uh, the Secretary of the, the, of the Department of the Taoiseach, which was Sean Crow Mean, um, Michael Summers, who was head of NTMA, uh, Morris O'Connell, uh, who was who's later Governor of the Central Bank, we, we met three, four times a week working and getting through that crisis. So you do, you do I think, Deputy, appreciate you gain a lot of experience from that. For, for me to say it would have made any difference. Quickly in Thank you, Chair. My last question. I think you said earlier that you take no responsibility for what the central bank, what was happening in the financial regulator. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, well, what I said, um, the, the ability, as, if, just to, to be clear about this, it's regular with people that say to me, you know, they say, Bertie, listen, you, you, you must have known the extent of A, B, or C of what they owed the bank, that they hadn't got guarantees. You must have seen the files. Um, I know you people here are experts on this issue now, but the general public believe that the Taoiseach of the day, and even very sophisticated people in there, believe that you had this information, that I knew what X, Y owed, and what guarantees he had, and that I was over coffee talking to the Governor's Centre Bank. I didn't know anything about any of that. If I did have, if I did have, I would have lashed it out in the doll someday or in some speech when okay. it was down in Treasury or something. But the point is, when you're teaching, you don't have any of that. Well, my question so I take stick okay. for lots of things, but right. not stick for something I have zero control well, over. Well, Central banks all over the democratic world, and even in the not-so-democratic world, are totally independent. 
uh, are totally removed from politics for the reason they don't want politics in it. So you can't have it both ways. I, I, I just want to come in on that point for a second before I bring Deputy McGavick, if you can just conclude, okay. please. Yeah, well, just comments. the point about this, the general responsibility, because in October 2009, in an interview with the Financial Times, you reported okay. as... This is the line of question I'm going to It's exactly the line of question, okay. sorry, Chair. It was reported as stating that the decision to create a new financial regulator was one of the main reasons for the collapse of the Irish banking sector. That new financial regulator was uh, set up while you were Taoiseach um, on the advice of Mr McCarthy. Was the McCarthy compromise the type of regulator? So do you take responsibility for that? To the McCarthy compromise? For the, the setting up of the new financial regulator, which is one of the main reasons for the, the setting up of the new financial regulator, which is one of the main reasons for the collapse of the Irish banking sector. Well, you I, I, I was Taoiseach and I, I was actually chaired the negotiations uh, on that. Just, 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 for, just for the rec record, Chairman, I, I, I didn't do any interview with the Financial Times since I left the Office of Taoiseach. Uh, thank you, Mr Hearn. I'd like to stay in that area of regulation, if I may. Um, we heard from Mr Patterson, who is the chairperson of the financial regulator, that in the 1990s, the sectoral concentration limits um, in the banks were relaxed to attract one large foreign bank into the country. And then as a result, the implication was they were relaxed for all the banks already working here. Do you have any familiarity with that, or do you remember that? I don't. Okay. Um, just to come back to something I raised earlier um, in the Financial Times, it wasn't an interview that you gave in October 2009. You were giving interviews, I think, on the radio here, and the Financial Times reported that you said that the decision to create a new financial regulator was one of the main reasons for the collapse of the Irish banking sector. Did you say this? No, I, I don't. I, I tried to check, actually. Um, I tried to, to check before the hearing um, wh wh where, where was the source of that, um, a source of that interview, and um, I wasn't able to, 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 to get that. But if I can tell you, I can answer your question in this way. Uh, there was um, a lot of fairly heated discussion and meetings that I chaired about how we would implement the 1999 report uh, and how we would get a compromise. And I know you discussed last night um, of the McCarthy compromise, but um, I, I would have been fairly well on the side of leave well enough alone uh, because it was concern in the central bank. Um, but at the same time, there was, a, there was a compelling argument because of the difficulties that had come out of the Dirt report that we should make those changes. And there was a compromise, and I accepted the compromise. So uh, I don't think to, to say to, to say that it, it, it was the cause of the uh, issue. I, I don't believe if I said that, and if I did say that, that that's not correct. Okay, well, do you take responsibility for the structure of regulation that you brought in? Um, I, 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 that the negotiations that took place that led to the compromise, I chaired those discussions, so I was responsible. Okay. And why did the 2003 Act require the financial regulator to also market and promote the uh, IFSC abroad? Well, he'd been working on, on, on that previously. I don't see anything wrong with that. Like we're, we're, I know there's been an issue made about this. Was, was that um, in some way tied his hands? Uh, I, I don't really see that. Listen, we're, a, we're, we're a country that haven't got huge resources in the administrative system for having separate agencies and separate organisations and if people can double up in the promotion uh, of it, the central bank working together. Like in the early years, I mean, it, it, all the people are in the clearinghouse group, the central bank was there, the regulators there, revenue were there, government departments were there. I, I, I don't really uh, think that that created uh, any weaknesses in the system. I know there's been some changes now. Um, and from what I can hear, the changes don't add up to a lot um, in, in so far as the system works very much the same. Uh, they have two, two different groups. The, one group meets now and then another group meets separately. It, 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 the, the changes are, aren't substantive. Just finally then, I mean, you would meet with the financial regulator to discuss the promotion of the IFSC? Um, it, it, cert certainly um, at the clearinghouse group functions that I would go to the regulator would be there. But you never at any point discussed the prudential regulation of the banking system in Ireland? At any point? Never. It never crossed your mind to approach him yourself, even though he hadn't approached you? No, no, because I, the, the old system had prevailed that um, the person who was the, uh, the face of, of, of that end was the, was the governor of the central bank. And I, I did go um, to the central bank person, and the central bank governor did come to me.
at regular meetings. Okay, thank you.